We think he's outstanding. We think he's our quarterback of the future. Uh, we just couldn't get together at this particular time. I think it's easily worth noting that uh, uh, a lot of people this year in the franchise mode uh, didn't get together. One of the biggest reasons is the backdrop of, of the COVID. One of the biggest reasons is the economic issue. I've just spent weeks and weeks, a part of this rasp voice on the phone, talking with NFL and the Players Association, weeks and weeks working through the economic consequences. And candidly, nobody knows what's going to be there next year, next year, or the next year. And frankly, we all know that what we were talking about in Dak's case was the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year. So all of that came to bear, and this was just a less than stable time to be talking about serious, serious, generational, if you will, to use Dak's term, dollars, and an unknown period of time looking forward. Business is business, and once I'm in the uh, in the locker room and a part of this, uh, a part of what's going on now, I don't focus too much about the future, uh, just more about today. Um, and so with that being said, I'm excited as hell to be a Dallas Cowboy. Uh, I've been a fan of this organization and been a fan of this program for, for years. Uh, I love every bit of um, the opportunity and the platform that I get to be the quarterback here. I love this team. I'm excited about what we have, uh, what we what we can do and accomplish this year. So. Um, no frustration as far as that. Uh, once again, I believe something will get done. And with my hopes, I believe I'll be a Dallas Cowboy uh, for the rest of my career. I don't think anybody's been able to compartmentalize football and business better than Dak Prescott. And I think at the end of the day, Shereen, that's the reason why he has never buckled. He has never just said, okay, enough money is enough money. Generational is generational. It doesn't need to be a giant capital G generational. I can just take the Cowboys offer of generational money, even though I can work this system to my advantage if I treat it more like a business. He has treated it like a business. I think now, look, maybe there are others who have done it as well, but I can't think of anyone who has done it better than Dak Prescott, where he can just wall off the business aspects, focus on football, take care of football business, which sets him up even better for business business. And the Cowboys have never hidden, Mike, their agenda of trying to separate players from agents and talk to players individually and trying to sell them on the deal. This is why we want to give you this deal. Let us spell it out for you. And they tried to do that with Dak Prescott, and he called his agent, Todd France, and said, should I talk to the Cowboys? And he, and he wouldn't do it, and he didn't go for the deal in the end. At the 11th hour, as, Dak, as uh, Des Bryant, we saw him do that in 2014, the same thing transpired and he ended up signing the deal at the 11th hour and and so Dak didn't go uh, for that and he, he did compartmentalize as you said football and business and, and he does do it very well and, and the, the fact that he didn't get a deal done won't affect him at all he'll, he'll be just fine on the football field he'll do what he needs to do and, and facts are facts he's going to make 31 million this year which is 27 28 million more than he's made in his career so far on the field of course he's made a lot more off the field as quarterback of the dallas cowboys so i do think he ends up staying with the cowboys but the fact that they didn't get it done obviously leaves some doubt in there whether they do get it done or not we played jerry's comments yesterday along with some words from steven and my reaction at the end of it was i love both of those guys i love what they've done for football but i'm not buying their explanation the explanation, the truth is, they have consistently underestimated Dak Prescott's resolve. They have underestimated his willingness to say, no, thank you. I will go with door number two. I'm not interested in door number one. And, you know, from a conceptual standpoint, I think this is so important for players and agents to understand. The Cowboys created this mess specifically by applying the franchise tag. They used a right available to them under the collective bargaining agreement to restrict a player whose contract had expired from becoming a free agent. They made the first move in this game of chess, and they decided to make a big move by not simply using the non-exclusive tag that would have cost $27 million or so this year, but also would have opened the door for someone to try to pilfer Dak Prescott if they were willing to give up a couple of first-round draft picks. The Cowboys went with the Cadillac option, $31.4 million, exclusive franchise tender, sends a message, this is our guy. And that's when Dak Prescott sits down and starts doing the math, Shereen. And I've been saying this all along. It doesn't matter what Russell Wilson makes. It doesn't matter what Patrick Mahomes makes. It doesn't matter where the market's going or where the cap is. 
Once you apply that exclusive franchise tag, Dak Prescott has clear rights. $31.4 million this year. $37.68 million next year if they tag him again. If not, he gets to become a free agent, and we'll see what the market will bear. And then the Kirk Cousins slash Armageddon situation for the Cowboys in 2022. $45 million under the transition tag. $54 million under the franchise tag. $54 million under the franchise tag if they want to keep him for that third year or let him hit the market. And I've been saying this all along because people are like, what's Dak Prescott really worth? What's his market value? Well, the Cowboys have kept us from finding out. And their effort to keep us from finding out has put him in a position where he can start down this path where he makes nearly $70 million over two years and then maybe ends up on the open market. Well, and Mike, the three deals that we saw yesterday really undermine their excuse of, well, COVID played into this, the unknown economic landscape played into this in the future. We saw huge deals yesterday with Deion Dawkins with the Bills and Travis Kelsey and and George Kittle. We saw all those big deals happen. And, and obviously the deadline has passed. The Cowboys can't do that deal now, but they could have done that deal before July 15th. And the fact is they didn't want to pay Dak Prescott what he wanted. He wanted a five, he wanted a four year deal. The Cowboys wanted a five year deal and the guaranteed money that they were offering on a five year deal wasn't enough. And so that's why they are where they are at this point and wondering if Dak Prescott will be their quarterback beyond this season, something that they thought I guarantee you was unfathomable uh, a year ago. They've been working on this thing for more than a year and they couldn't get it done. And, and here's the thing, you know, you can hide behind the notion that there's financial uncertainty and look, there is, and the salary cap may be only 175 million next year. But one thing we've seen time and again during the age of the salary cap, there are devices for managing the cap. There are ways to pay your best players and kick the can down the road with other players to try to make it all fit in any given year. And really, it's far more challenging for the Cowboys next year to go forward with Dak Prescott having a cap number of $37.68 million that can't be reduced without a long-term deal. That's his salary. That's his cap hit next year. And if the salary cap is 175 and your quarterback is taking up 37.68 of it, you got a far bigger problem than giving Dak the contract he wanted now and trying to make it fit under the cap next year. So I, I don't buy any of that. Look, the truth is... They have made, they being the Cowboys, consistently bad decisions about Dak Prescott's resolve. They've underestimated him. You know, Tony Romo, end of the day, agreed and took the Cowboys' offer, and it was a team-friendly offer. And they've seen it over and over again where they ultimately get what they want. Like you said, Shireen, they throw their arm around the guy and they talk him into doing the deal. Dak's the first one who stood up to them and said, no, I'm not doing it. And I don't think they know how to handle it. Well, and you look at the Chiefs, Mike, you talk about fitting it under the cap. Remember when the Chiefs had less than $200, $200, not $200,000, not $2 million, $200 under the salary cap, and they've been able to get all their core players signed long-term, and they've done it, and they've rearranged contracts to get that done, and they are set, and the, here the Cowboys sit. Well, it's COVID. Well, it's the financial landscape. We can't get this done right now. That had nothing to do with it. It is the fact that Dak had this resolve that they were just unprepared for, and, and now they are where they are. Of course, it helps that the Chiefs got their franchise quarterback to accept a contract that has a horribly low signing bonus, abysmal cash flow over the next few years. I mean, Dak Prescott, and peep, I, you know, when I made the argument after the Holmes deal was was announced and we saw the numbers that there's no way Dak Prescott would take that deal. People thought I was nuts. I mean, I, I've given them plenty of reasons over the years to come to that conclusion, but on this one, I'm not. <laughs> Dak would not take that deal, especially when you look at the most important metrics, signing bonus, guaranteed money, fully guaranteed money at signing, and cash flow over the first three years. The Mahomes deal is horrendous, and what Dak would make over the next three years, and which is what he's going to make this year, 31-4 this year. Patrick Mahomes making $10, $11 million this year. The, the, the first three years, the next three years, just blows Mahomes away. And at the end of those three years, if Dak does go year to year under the franchise tag, he goes wherever he wants. Mahomes is still locked up for nine more years with the Chiefs.
The biggest mistake, Mike, that I think the Cowboys made was not getting this deal done before Jared Goff, before Carson Wentz, and they had an opportunity to do that, and they didn't do that. And those two deals came out, and I was like, oh, my gosh, you can't pay Dak Prescott that kind of money. He's not worth that. And now when you look at the Carson Wentz deal and the Jared Goff deal, they look pretty darn good. If they had done it back then, the Cowboys would be sitting in great shape. To me, that was the biggest mistake they made was not getting that deal done long ago, well before he played his fourth season and played out his contract. And here's the thing that I keep waiting for a team to do that has that young quarterback that they know based upon his first three seasons, he's our guy. Whether it's Lamar Jackson this year entering season three with the Ravens or next year, Kyler Murray, your favorite, entering year three with the Arizona Cardinals. Shereen doesn't like Kyler because he transferred from Texas A&M. So anyway, <laughs> Kyler Murray next year. Uh, once you know, and the Cardinals already know now, but they can't give him the second contract until the third season ends. Specifically, and I've looked at this time and again in the CBA to make sure I'm not missing something, it's when the third regular season ends. That's when you can sign that extension. So what you do when the player is in that third season and he's getting closer and closer to the end of the regular season, that's when you start negotiating. You're allowed to negotiate before you're allowed to do the deal. I mean, technically, the Cowboys and Dak Prescott could be negotiating now the deal that they'd sign after this regular season ends if they want to do it. You start negotiating with that young quarterback, and you put your best offer on the table the moment the regular season ends, and he's going to take it. He's going to take it then because he still has games to be played, playoff games to be played if he's, you know, as good as – as you think he is, and he's positioning himself for a huge payday, you should be in the playoffs. You get him to sign that contract before that first playoff game. You take the injury risk off his shoulder before that playoff game after his third season. You get the deal done as soon as the third regular season ends. I'm amazed no one's done that. And, Shereen, I think if the Cowboys would have done that and gotten Dak Prescott, the best offer they would have made at the time before the Seahawks wild card game after the 2018 season – would have been a hell of a lot less money than what they're looking at spending now. Absolutely, no question about it, and, and that's where they failed. They failed a year ago, a year and a half ago, more than they failed now, um, not getting this deal done before July 15th. So, I, you know, I think the Cowboys, as you said, that they, they thought they could talk Dak Prescott into this deal. They've done it so many times with so many players they thought they could put their what they think is their best deal on the table and say, here's the reasons we need you to take this team. Hey, they said it publicly. Stephen Jones and Jerry Jones both said publicly, we need Dak to take a team-friendly deal. That's what they continued to call it, a team-friendly deal. And Dak said, it's not my job to, to manage your cap. You've got to manage your cap. I'm going to get my generational money. And, and he is going to end up getting his generational money, whether it's with the Cowboys or with somebody else. There is that spectrum with Peyton Manning at one end, who always had that attitude. My job is to play quarterback. Your job is to manage the cap. And then there's Tom Brady at the other end, who took the team-friendly deals. And again, he didn't take the team-friendly deals because he had this master plan that he's going to win six Super Bowls and he's going to consciously take less money. He took the team-friendly deals because he was scared to death he was going to have a bloated cap number one year and Bill Belichick was going to kick his butt to the curb like Belichick did with Drew Bledsoe. That's why Tom Brady took team-friendly deals in New England. But... I never know where a quarterback is going to land on that spectrum, and Dak Prescott is right there next to Peyton Manning. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.